the talk I prepared is, is I'm not sure it's really about philosophical conundrums and what is a conundrum? It's actually a, uh, there's no known origin for the word. It's actually, they think it was made up by maybe a college student in the 1600s. Uh, it's sort of like a pig Latin expression. It really doesn't mean much of anything. What I do know, and I'm not going to be talking about technical impasses that sometimes stop a work, and I'm not really talking about those character traits like procrastination or inability to focus or organize one's workshop or conversely spending too much time organizing one's workshop. Uh, all those foibles that sometimes wreak havoc with an artistic project and uh, suck energy like some hideous tick. Uh, I'm not even talking about problems here. Uh, so what do I mean by philosophical conundrums? I also don't really feel like rehashing the, the discussions that went on in CMA a few years back about the uh, definition of mosaic, which probably will cause a big sigh of relief to those of y'all that were around at that point, or the definition of tessera. Uh, those discussions can get quite philosophical and quite conundrum-y real quick. Uh, and I'm actually quite fond of, those, fond of those discussions, but I've talked a lot about them and I don't want to concentrate them on, on tonight. And I shouldn't really even be talking about philosophy because I don't really, I have vague notions about actual branches of philosophy. I'm, I'm using the phrase in the more common folk sense of just ruminations or speculations. And I'm talking about the uh, thought cul-de-sacs that uh, sometimes occur when the hands are doing stuff. Uh, sometimes they hinder the work, sometimes they help, and sometimes they just accompany it. Here's an example. In, uh, there's a 1941 short work of fiction by a South American writer, uh, Jorge Luis Borges. It's called Pierre Menard, author of the Quixote. And it pretends to be a piece of literary criti criticism about another work which is completely fictional, as is its author, Pierre Menard. And Borges is pretending to review Menard's work, which is a novel, uh, identical to the original Don Quixote. Uh, in Borges' fictional reviewer's opinion, the newer story is argued to be better and richer in illusion. The copy is felt to be a more creative work than the original. Borges' work sometimes comes to mind when I see yet another copying scandal in the mosaic world. There are, of course, various types of copying scandals. There's the outright copying of one by one mosaicist of another's work, sometimes in admiration and sometimes for less admirable reasons, or less innocent reasons, I shouldn't say admirable. Uh, the original can either be an ancient or contemporary work. A subset of outright copying is when some shop is set up in a second or third world country and a group of fairly skilled and usually explo exploited workers are given designs to knock off. And there's the copying and I should air quote that, of a painting by a mosaicist. Most of us know that what is, what is considered to be the, like the shameful past of mosaics, where um, it was considered painting's weaker sister. And uh, much of modern mosaic has been a flight from this past, a search for some sort of essential mosaicness. Uh, it, it sort of reminds me of mosaics uh, of a uh, Plato's cave where everything we experience is just a faint shadow of some eternal chainless form. So let's go to the next slide. That is not the next slide. There it is. Cutting stone and porcelain with saws and then fitting the pieces tightly together is just about the slowest way one can possibly imagine to record an image. Photography is, of course, much easier, especially with Photoshop, and drawing is easier. Uh, painting is easier. Is there any reason at all to record an image in stone, stone and porcelain and glass other than to proclaim, in effect, look how well I can do this? <laughs> Good mosaicists of all stripes are a little like magicians in that so much of their work is so much of the time hidden from the audience. When someone chooses to go the long way around to get somewhere, 
there is sometimes a good reason. This translation of a photograph into mosaic has a thousand alterations incorporated. The wall, other than the poster, is totally different than the photo. The, uh, this is from a postcard that Deborah found when she was living in Mexico years ago. Uh, I took it and modified it heavily. Uh, I haven't, by the way, put any sizes on these things. So I'll, if anybody asks, I'll, if that one's about like this. Uh, I just to, let me sh I will point out some tests as I go along. Where's the pen? There we go. This little piece right here, the, the scale right there, that's all one piece out of a little cheap piece of wall tile. Uh, it's about the fourth try that it took to cut that. All right. That's, Levin. that's coming up. Okay. It's skipping. That's interesting. It's skipping. Huh. It's, it's skipped the slide. We'll see. I hope it doesn't do that. You'll be seeing every other slide. The piece before that, the slide before that, was an old junk store photo that this is based on. Uh, let me try that one more time, why that would be that way. I, That, that's the, I don't, why would it be in the, that's the junk store photo that we found. And that's very strange it's doing that. All right, that's the uh, piece that comes from. Uh, this is an early work of mine. It, when, you do something like this, it becomes mythic somehow. A photo catches the flow of the moment and freezes it in great detail. A mosaic of that photo abstracts it, and that action exposes the intention and the beliefs of the maker more clearly because it shows what lines the maker chooses to emphasize or create. Oh, I hope this goes right. There are additions to a photo, like the earring here, and the momentous decisions as to what muscular contours, what folds in fabric, what gradations in fur to represent a single cut. I think that the abstractions one chooses, where one decides to make a cut to represent, represent innumerable gradations, and every photo-based mosaic contains many of these, are where some of the most interesting art in mosa mosaics can occur. Such decisions can be especially challenging when using a material that contains no gradation like this brick, which is what the body of uh, Washoe is. Washoe was uh, the chimp who uh, learned sign language, one of the first ones. She was named after a county in Nevada, which was named in turn after a Native American people, the Washoe, which were from Nevada in California, I think. So this is brick, travertine, the face, a little bit of marble up in the uh, background and a turquoise earring, which not you can't really tell that's turquoise. Um, all right. There are changes one makes because the saw is unable to make the kind of cut that the photo would seem to call for. There are stylistic elements that are in introduced into a photo-based mosaic because a saw blade does not make you turns very well. Copying can be creative, even and this will be a controversial statement. Even I believe the slavish copying of one mosaic into another, the internal experience of the person doing it can feel creative, whether it's legally or morally right is a whole nother question. I've copied certain photos, altering certain aspects by necessity and others by whim. And at the time, sometimes I have felt as creative and as original as when I've drawn out an entire design for a work without reference to any visible model. This is a translation of a photo by a famous uh, photographer, Elliot Erwitt. I changed the dog completely. Uh, this is a pretty early work, and there are a number of things I do different now, uh, as you know, I suppose anybody could say about their early stuff. And so anyway, we're wondering about copies. That's some, an example of one of the conundrums that I will sometimes spend my time 
doing while I'm working in the saw. Here's a painting. It's called Der Strike, Coal Miner Strike. I lifted the guy over there in the corner <laughs> and turned it into, and I actually kind of meant this to be kind of an ugly piece, uh, the background and stuff sort of. Uh, so, next. The question of how you got, got, got into mosaics generally throws me into fits to confusion. There are so many ways to approach that question. My life, like I'm sure most others, does not easily fit into a unified narrative or a standard plot line. I could approach the question by talking about how I acquired the skills. My father and I built my parents' retirement home in 1976 when neither dad or I had ever built a doghouse before. Um, I could point to the bathrooms and the floors and the fireplaces that I've built after that in my own home, our own home, which is this one, uh, and another one I rehabilitated one block from here. The first attempts of cutting tile and stone were done with a simple circular saw, which is just like this, except it had an abrasion blade on it. Uh, the dust would be billowing off the slate and, the, and filling the inside of my house, which was stupid, or the driveway, which was also stupid. This very strange bathroom is too... Uh, the bathroom is there through the open door. That other picture is the wall that you can't see behind the door. This was all done with a regular circular saw when I really didn't know what I was doing. Uh, I had zero idea what I was doing and I wouldn't do the snake again if I had to do it all over. It, it was a strange time in my life. I was, I was actually laying in the tub and wondering what my next project was going to be. And I let out the water and I was laying there and I heard the water on the ground underneath the house. And I realized, uh-oh, the plumbing had totally deteriorated and the bath, the floor had deteriorated. And so while I had my next project, um, it's a, it's a great freedom in this culture to own your own house and not be thinking about the resale value. <laughs> so let's see if this works. This is a short 30 second video of my technique and I don't see it coming up. The uh, hit, escape. hit escape. I'll try that. Oh, Deborah, you are a genius. This is basically what I spend hours doing. This is a wet saw, a regular contractor's wet saw. Usually people use the tray there and move stuff into it and cut, make straight cuts. This is not the way anybody will tell you to use a wet saw. <laughs> What's it? Now, this is diamond blade. It looks really dangerous. Diamond blades, I hit my fingers probably 50 times a day. They never draws blood. It doesn't cut your flesh. It cuts your fingernails really badly. You, you don't want it to hit that. But it, uh, it so that's that, that one. Um, long deads. Long Dead Seas, an ancient forest from many million years ago, fuel my saws in the form of natural gas and coal. Those oceans and forests captured energy from sunlight, locking it down into chemical bonds, which we learned to crack, just like we learned long before that, to burn wood and release the energy locked in. All that fossil fuel provides us with what's been called the ghost acreage. It's as if we're living on a planet much bigger than the actual one, and all that extra space has been described as the ghost acreage. Anchorage. I claim a little bit of that every time I turn on my saws. And there's a very personal conundrum for me in that. How much of that acreage am I claiming for my art? 
when I make those intricate cuts, when I upload my images, when I pack and send my art thousands of miles away. Does my art merit such a claim? And here's the second type of saw I use. I got this one only about five years ago because the other one is not dangerous in the short term. If you use it as much as I have, it can cause long-term damage to your hands in the forms of vibration. And you start getting weird nerve things and other things going on, which I won't go into. Um, this is my bandsaw, and here's, I'll have to hit escape again, I assume. There we no, I don't want to do that. Deborah. <laughs> Deborah, what happened? Do what? There? That's from beginning. Well, I can just go through these. I haven't gone through enough of them to... But what will I do when I get to that? Will it... Yeah. Come on. Come on, little fella. All right, we're getting close. Sorry. All right, there. Now. Move your mouse around towards the bottom of the. They said, oh, it showed up the time. Okay. All right, I should have just tried that first. So here's the second little. This. Deborah just filmed this on her cell phone. That's you. I actually put down. It's a lot easier on your hand, but it takes a lot longer. It's uh, and that blade, that band, which is about this big, and like this. If you kink it, it snaps, and there goes 160 bucks. Uh, so you have to get really attuned to the sound of the blade and the feel of it in your hands. So that's that. I... Well, it's almost finished. <laughs> All right. A whole class of thought cul-de-sacs that I tend to fall into while, while sawing is the review of the past. And I try not to waste all my time regretting things in my past because I need at least a little time to fret about the future. <laughs> this is not me as a baby, but I was a baby once. <laughs> it's from an old photo we found at a junk store. Uh, Funny thing is, years later, this is hard to believe, but years later at an entirely different junk store, we found another photo of the same man and baby taken about three seconds later. Um, but this is another good example of uh, abstraction, figuring out what I was going to do with the guy's shirt. Uh, How much do life stories really help us understand or appreciate someone's art? I grew up from ages 5 to 16 in Lubbock, Texas, up in the Panhandle, formerly called the Staked Plains, where for several centuries the Comanche ruled. It's flat, dry, hot, and subject to violent storms. There were cotton fields in every direction. Everything was in a grid. There's a great book about measuring America, about the application of the grid to, uh, to America that I just finished reading. Early on, I was a fairly typical carefree boy. So let me, uh, again, the pen. This is all, where'd my cursor go? Oh, there it is. This is all, whoop, not there. Uh, this is all one, oh. <laughs> anyway, this whole piece without the, is one piece. The whole piece up 
around his head is one piece. Uh, and I, I like it when a simple cut like this uh, has such a difficult cut like this. Uh, it's not drawing attention to itself. It's seemingly just an unimportant part of the background, but it's demonstrating a cut that not many people do. How it curls all the way around his back wheel and goes in like that. When I finish something like that and the damn travertine doesn't break, I just... <laughs> all right. Do I possess an artistic disp disposition? What does that even mean? I suspect that it means radically different things to every person who ever considers it. My mother and her sister, Aunt Connie, were both good painters and creative in their own ways, although Aunt Connie was much more accomplished as a painter. Their father, my grandfather Frank, also had a lot of artistic talent, but he was unfortunately a mean, worthless, violent drunk. This is, piece is very loosely based on my Aunt Connie, whose favorite curse word was, oh, pineapple. I only realized it, it, it reminded me of her after I made the piece, actually, and after I got it done, I went, oh, yeah, that's Aunt Connie. Again, and I'll try this. I'm going to, by the end of this, I'll be pretty good at the pen thing. This piece of onyx is all one piece. There, I'm doing it all right this time. It is all one cut. Uh, this is also one of the earliest, you'll see a lot of circles in my work. This is one of the first times they ever appear, just little embedded circles. I don't know what they mean, but they show up in a lot of my work. Primarily, I see myself as a gardener. Uh, this is from a photo of me with a uh, sunflower that I grew from a seed that I planted in a Sunday school class probably one of about a dozen times I ever attended Sunday school. That's our backyard in Lubbock, and Mom and Dad both like to garden, and that's Mom there brooding on the Chase Lounge. Here's Mom again on a bender, portrayed as Medusa. As the years went by, Mom descended into alcoholism and madness. Uh, I think I masterfully captured her mouth twitching, which used to just terrify the crap out of us. That's our bitchy little toy poodle, Bridget. <laughs> the, the face on the bottle, which you can't see really well, is uh, Moses from a Ten Commandments commemorative plate uh, that had... Uh, uh, you'll see other parts of that Ten Commandments uh, plate and other pieces, uh, and there's no special reason why I put him on there other than I like the face on the bottle. Uh, I was a good student. Uh, I was actually a valedictorian at my high school, and then I went off to college, and that went on for 18 years. Those college years were interspersed with years of wild abandon, and also later with years of hard work as a programmer and a consultant. So again, I'll see if I can get the uh, pen. The... Oh, I've already got the pen. Oh, okay, cool. Well, I think uh, now that I know the pen's going to stay on. Uh... Oh, okay. I have to learn a whole new tool. Top, top button. <laughs> Damn it. Top button, all right. Oh, all right. Uh, the mustache and the eyebrow cuts were uh, done with a little bitty, the little inland hobbyist bandsaw, those little bitty things. Uh, actually, uh, Irina Charney won that back at one of the psalms, and she already had one, and she gave it to me. And I wore it out in about a month. 
Uh, let's see. Where am I? Much of the material I've worked with has come with, from places like local tile contractors that have unused tile material from a job or a big box store or the local Habitat for Humanity materials store that used to have some really interesting stuff. This blue granite, that's uh, the, all this stuff was from uh, when I did our countertop in our kitchen and I had a bunch of stuff left over. In those years, there was perhaps too great a reliance on various mind-altering substances. <laughs> ah, there's nothing to say about that one. <laughs> and then everything went to shit. No, it's, I, actually, I think all of us uh, have evenings stamped with uh, disillusionment and exile. Uh, I'm especially proud of the guy's tummy in this one, and I like her face. All these are strips from various types of cheap tiled stuff that I cut every one of them to make the background. And now here I am. That's a distorted self shot from our little camera on the Mac. And uh, this has got a little bit more expensive set of materials. That's onyx hair. The uh, slate background had that natural X in it, in the stone. And when I saw that, I duplicated it in the little, that's a turquoise hat. The color's not great. And then uh, white marble shirt. Uh, the glasses frame is all one piece from there to there. That's a marble uh, the forehead test is also a nice one. These are little cuts in with the uh, bandsaw that you saw. Um, the title from this is from a famous poem written around 1620 or so by Robert Herrick, To the Young Virgins to Make Much of Time. Uh, so that actually wasn't much about my life story, and it didn't explain much how I got into mosaics, and there wasn't much talk of conundrums. But... Oh, it just came up. That's the title of the piece, Then Be Not Coy, which is his advice to the young virgins. Sometimes when trying to answer that vexing question about how I got into this, instead of talking about my life story or how I acquired the skills, I will talk about inspiration. I can talk about my old friend Randy Tucker and his animal cracker door. Uh, Randy had 100 acres up in West Virginia. He had a cabin up there. It did not have an indoor bathroom. He was trying to figure out why he couldn't attract a girlfriend. I said he needed an indoor bathroom. <laughs> he, he made an indoor bathroom and the door that he put on it, he, uh, he got a zillion boxes of animal crackers and made a tree of life out of animal crackers on the door and then shellacked it about 40 times thinking that uh, it would keep the mice away. It didn't. Uh, he was a very creative guy. He also, he, he won uh, 5,000 bucks at a casino uh, at a costume contest, contest by doing a card shark outfit where he was a shark made out of cards, a full body thing. It was really lovely. I can also talk about another friend, uh, Bill Bird, and uh, he was in, he saw a Hunterwasser, is that the way you pronounce it? Uh, 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 cattle, uh, calendar, and inspired him to do a bathroom, uh, which was just bizarre. And uh, so I, we got into this contest at that point of, uh, we called it uh, stupid expenditure of money. <laughs> I had more money at him at that point, and so I was able to uh, outdo him. Uh, I, out, I did, redid both my bathrooms in ridiculous fashion. You saw one of them. <laughs> this is the first one, one part of it. Uh, that's a uh, stone that was brought back from Arkansas by yet another friend, uh, and there's a walnut arm that I got a load of walnut from a garage sale 
to my towel valet. Uh, <laughs> doing this bathroom uh, permanently damaged my hearing when I was working under the uh, floor trying to correct some foundation problems using a circular saw with no hearing protection. Use hearing protection. As part of the spending money foolishing contest, I established a big community garden in a very stressed area of town on lots where houses had been torn down. I was already doing a lot of gardening at my home, and my concept of myself as primarily a gardener really took hold during this time, and also my sense of valiant, albeit futile, resistance against the tsunami of ignorance and evil that was crushing the planet, Oklahoma, and especially this neighborhood. This is all very cheap wall tile, except for the sidewalk, which was some nice porcelain. Uh, gardening anywhere, but especially in Oklahoma, is a humbling experience. Gardening in inner city Oklahoma City on a site that was being used as an open air crack market in the early 90s was an unforgettable, indelible experience. And I could go on and on with the stories from that time, but that's another conference or another summit. It did, however, help to instill in me the idea, the practice really, of keeping my head down and just trying to do the next right thing needed to accomplish what I wanted to accomplish. And trying not to question too much the desire to accomplish anything. The birth, the birth of agriculture might also be the birth of hierarchical societies. Almost immediately, the lowest ranked people farmed for the others. Even lower than them, however, were the first workers in mines to get medals for the weapons, for the temples, for the mints. Now rich people garden for fun. This is a recent work of mine. My brother's youngest daughter owns it now, and I love it, and I'm so glad she owns it. I have never understood the assertion, sometimes implicit, sometimes explicit, that abstract, non-figurative mosaic enables one to better, better appreciate the materials used, lets them shine through, so to speak, because there's not all those distracting figures in there screwing with our minds. We have these huge, enormously complex brains firing on many levels at all times, or at least we want them to be, uh, I think as we stroll through a gallery or a museum. How does one become incapable of fully seeing the beauty of a selection of materials because the design is too engrossing, too distracting? We can't appreciate materials or texture or ondamento or whatever the flavor of the month may be because the mind is too busy recognizing a representation of something in the natural world, perhaps. This is travertine, onyx, and turquoise in the, uh, alongside the caterpillar. Are we really that poor in sight? We can't process many different colors, lines, flows, connotations, mythic components, narrative fragments all at once. Our brains don't have billions upon billions of synaptic connections. My brain, for one, finds that insulting. Although I do recognize that recognizable patterns or figures can sometimes hijack attention and consequently make one believe that a piece is primarily about one thing or another. Figurative art channels perception. But so what? So does non-figurative art, perhaps in even more insidious ways at times. And who says that the elusive essence of mosaic has to be the showcasing of materials or the minimalism of color worship? Uh, Salisaw is a town in Oklahoma. It comes from a French word meaning salt provisions. Uh, French explorers salted buffalo meat right around there. A few months back, we bought some rain barrels to collect water off the roof of our house. For several years, Oklahoma had been in the grips of a horrible drought, and so it seemed like a good idea. For two of the barrels, I needed to install just a short piece of guttering. I'm fairly handy, and so it didn't sound too hard, but because we have an old house whose roof line does not lend itself easily to the modern cheap gutters that you find at the big box stores, it ended up taking much of one day with repeated trips back to the store, repeated trips up the ladder, and repeated fits of loud cursing and annoying the neighbors. What really bothered me about the experience is it was detail work to me. I wasn't trying to be an expert in it. 
I didn't see any inherent beauty in it. I just wanted it done so I could get back to the quote unquote important things I was doing. That attitude made me sloppy, made me hurried, made, kept me from my eyes from seeing obvious things. And it has been part of the reason that a belief system has arisen within me every so often that the physical inanimate world is sometimes out to get me. It's the closest thing I get to any kind of belief in the supernatural, which is kind of ridiculous because that belief comes from dealing with the least supernatural things, gutters, garden hoses, anything mechanical. I become an animist of sort. I find myself thinking that various things, hoses, tools, stones, bits of porcelain, glass, are actually out to bedevil me. And I'll actually ask those things when the host catches on the tiniest bit of twig. Oh, does that exasperate me? When the travertine that actually cut, I've cut four times actually seems to have grown as a result of all the cutting, I find myself asking, querying them, really? Really? In the workshop, I can get really, really foul. And at times, as Deborah can attest, as sometimes some of my neighbors can attest, I can get really, really loud. I rarely get similarly loud when sometimes when things go right, when some piece just slips right in on the first cut. Such a readiness to see a vast conspiracy to frustrate me amongst inanimate objects is not a philosophical stance that furthers the day's progress. It never helps to, ar it never helps to argue with matter, especially matter that's been cooked for millions of years or melted in man-made sun-like furnaces Matter just is. It's not in the arguing business. And in Mosaic, where almost all the matter that matters is hard and brittle and unforgiving, you just always lose the argument. The material does not compromise. It does not give a little or come halfway or see your point of view even a little bit. You give in. You accept its demands. And if you want it to fit a certain way, then you have to cut it a certain way. You learn humility if you did not already possess it, you learn to submit to the rules of the game. As I've said, the, the problem with the gutter lies in the idea of detail work, unimportant work, work that I have to do before I get to the really interesting stuff. In Mosaic, the unimportant work many times associates itself with the concept of a background, with the practice of a background. But I think the idea that there is a background in the work is potentially very damaging. Everything from edge to edge, to frame to frame, if God forbid you use a frame, is equally important. There is no background. There seems to me to be a more self, no more self-evident concept in mosaic than in some of the other visual arts because the area one might be tempted to call the background takes a huge amount of time, just like the foreground. It's not a matter of just dashing it off, a sort of you get the general idea, brush strokes. And the concept of no background can even be extended to activities like cleaning the work. My own particular subgenre of mosaic is called opus sectile or opus sectile. Uh, but it's a kind that I invented for myself. I didn't really take up traditional opus techniques. In fact, I only have the haziest idea of how they uh, work. Uh, I just know they're cut and then the entire piece is polished down. Uh, I can't do that because I'm using porcelain, cheap tile, so every piece is cut and placed and that's it. Uh, their traditional opus can be even more exacting than this where there's just not an atom's space between the, the uh, materials. Um, all mosaic takes patience and delay of gratification. And I think there may be exceptions to this, like uh, Isaiah Zager up in the Magic Gardens. Uh, uh, but using a saw involves a kind of mosaic, a, a type of discipline that is even unlike traditional mosaic. When making a long, involved cut on a tessera like this, one must eyes must not leave the edge of the blade when it is biting into the stone, and this might take, I don't know, six or eight or ten minutes of continuous cutting. It some days, sometimes feels like days of not lifting your eyes from that moving point, and that is, at least for me, a really hard thing to do. And you're trying to hear subtle shifts in the sound of the blade that might indicate that it's about to bind and tear the piece from your hands, and you are doing this with headphones on, 
which is so isolating and you can't even listen to music. You are alone with your thoughts. If you ever find yourself considering whether you might want to spend some time with tile saws in this way, ask yourself, are you comfortable with your thoughts? <laughs> After you've been cutting for a while, if you find that you've forgotten to breathe, if you've already spent so long in this one piece with all the delicate cuts that you really don't want to screw it up now, and it makes you hold your breath, and you forget you're holding your breath, and you're sawing away and you're not controlling your breath, well, your sight, your hearing, and your sense of touch will all be adversely affected in unpredictable fashion. And you also find if you're not standing properly with bent knees and proper posture, once again, your sight, your concentration will suffer. This piece won a, uh, a Juror's Award uh, up in Tacoma. It's an example of an intrusion of narrative figurative art onto an abstract design that I drew in about 20 seconds. Uh, sitting on the couch, all the lines, the uh, woman just forced her way into the piece. Uh, she can be seen as Persephone arising from Hades after her six months sojourn underground. It could be that. It's spring. Matteo Randi, who awarded its prize, uh, remarked that it had no tessera, a remark that I find interesting. A tessera is a thing used in a mosaic, which in turn is a thing which uses tessera. That's a conundrum. That's a B cut smalty in the background. Uh, and then this little uh, house was a tough little cut in there. The controlling of attention while using a saw is, sometime, is somehow inextricably linked to activities such as dance or playing music. This piece, by the way, had un ungrouted grout lines. A lot of times I do put in a black grout, it makes things pop. This one didn't seem to need it. So I could sell bird pieces all day long, it seems, as many as I could make. In general, they sell faster than anything else I make. This is a very early piece of mine, maybe of one, one of the first 10 pieces I ever made. It's based on an old watercolor that my mother gave me. My mother's name was Zella, and she was named after her Aunt Zella, whose grave I just found this past summer. The South Texas history of that side of my family is so very, very colorful. This is, this is on an old treadle sewing machine cast iron base. I made uh, several tables like this. They're very heavy. Here's another one, which even though this segment is supposed to be called birds, this has no birds. This is uh, a, some rainforest marble, uh, porcelain butt. Uh, those little, oh, excuse me, things over here, even though they're brown, they meant, I meant them to be uh, horsetail reeds, uh, equisetum, something, something, I don't know. Uh, there's, they were from cheap little uh, one-inch tile. Uh, they're related to giant horsetail trees that used to grow over huge swaths of the, of the planet about 540 million years ago, and they made much of the coal that we use today. Uh, I don't know if you can see it. That's a big head lying sideways. It was supposed to be like a fallen old. There's the lips. The, this. There's no birds. There's a talking fish, though. Uh, still no birds. <laughs> There's some birds. These are all these are on treadle sewing machine bases. Uh, this is this is a much smaller piece, just about like that. I once uh, when, let me go to the next piece. I think that's where it is. Yeah. I once saw a clip on America's Funniest Home Videos that showed one of these birds, uh, green, green heron, that was doing something that I, he was on a, uh, a dock going out and there was people on the dock and they were dropping crumbs on it and the bird was going over and picking up the crumbs and taking over and dropping them in the water and fish would come up and wham, hit them. I had no idea birds would 
ever had that thought process, be able to do that. Anyway, uh, the background of this uh, is from some very hard porcelain tile. Uh, the same stuff as the woman's butt uh, a couple slides ago. It's extremely hard and polished, and yet marking it with a wax pencil permanently stained it, which I found out to my horror a couple times. Here's a little... Uh, uh, Cowbirds use vireo nest, among others, to lay their nest in. The vireo hatches the egg along with its own, and the cowbird out competes and kills its net mates, net, nest mates. I once got into a bad argument with an old friend about their rescue of a cowbird baby. It just about ruined the friendship. Uh, whooping crane, another small piece. This started, uh, believe it or not, as a serious bird study, a stork, and it would have sold outright as a stork. I, I still own it. <laughs> I knew I was undercutting uh, the value that when I was replacing the head, when I knew when I gave him white socks on his feet that I was restricting a large part of my potential market. <laughs> it's hard to see. There's some very long cuts in the blue granite to go all the way across like that, really hard to keep it together. There's a lot of uh, rainforest marble in that. It's called rainforest marble. I don't know what part of the world it's from. Uh, uh, this was from a child's flashcard deck. Uh, the, uh, the bird, actually, the background I made most of it. I sometimes find myself uh, stripping the marketability out of a work, uh, disentangling it from any pretensions to serious successful art that I might have, separating a sense of, valid, uh, of value and a piece from what is stylish and what is in good taste or any of those cues that gives one a signal of one's seriousness as a fine art mosaicist or one's income or travel experiences. If a piece is not good decor, if it is not tasteful, if it is figurative and even cartoonish, that does not mean it's not good art. You know, good art, what does that even mean? What can it possibly mean anymore after the 20th century, after the white on white paintings, the black on black, the drips, the Warhol sea of crap, the uh, sliced cows, the Wayne White words painted over crappy uh, garage sale paintings? How is art valued? Is value simply another term for money now? Just ones and zeros floating on electricity? Back to the old story of Don Quixote, that delusional knight with his faithful sidekick, Sancho, tilting at windmills. What if we see him not as delusional at all? What if he knows that, the windmill, that those aren't windmills that he's fighting? What if he knows that what he's doing is absurd, clearly not rational, and he does them anyway as street theater? as a form of protest against the senselessness of existence or as an affirmation of the ability to create one's own meaning. This uh, sky cut, yeah, I keep using the wrong button, uh, is all one piece going down in there like that. And this, his little forehead cut is also, I think I used the little uh, inland deal with that. All right. Sometimes dishonesty, dishonesty self-deception, lying to oneself is the best approach to a new mosaic, especially when considering the time it will take to actually make the damn thing. It has become harder to do that with every piece I finish. With more experience under my belt, I approach each piece with, now with a stricter, more unavoidable, unavoidable appraisal, and I'm not sure that's a good thing. I did this as a joke for a nonprofit auction years ago. Willful ignorance is sometimes a useful tool, especially dogged militant ignorance, when one knows that there must be someone out there with the answer to your problem but refusing to find out what they know. Peter Bruegel, I think I pronounced that close, painted Landscape and the Fall of Icarus in 1558. That's not a very good picture of it. It's a I became aware of this from a famous poem. There's Icarus, way over here. 
Uh, W.H. Auden wrote a beautiful poem about this. Uh, about suffering, they were never wrong, the old masters. How well they understood its human position, how it takes place while someone else is eating or opening a window or just walking dully along. How when the aged are, aged are reverently, passionately waiting for the miraculous birth, there always must be children who did not specially want it to happen, skating in a pond at the edge of the wood. They never forgot that even the dreadful martyrdom must run its course anyhow in a corner, some untidy spot where the dogs go on with their doggy life and the torturer's horse scratches its innocent behind on a tree. In Bruegel's Icarus, for instance, how everything turns away quite leisurely from the disaster. The plowman may have heard the splash, the forsaken cry, but for him it was not an important failure. The sun shone as it had to on the white legs disappearing into the green water, and the expensive, delicate ship that must have seen something amazing, a boy falling out of the sky, had somewhere to get to and sailed calmly on. There are a couple birds in this work, <laughs> but it's really just a segue into the next segment. A long time ago, there was a head shop in OKC called the Abextra, and I bought a grass mat wall hanging there once, and I printed, it was printed on this, uh, uh, printed on it was this dancing couple, sans the background, it was just a dancing couple. And when I showed it to my friend Randy Tucker, the animal cracker guy, who knew a little art history, he immediately said, well, that's a detail from the background of this painting by, and I think it was some Flemish master. For years, I thought it was one of the Bruegels, but I can't, I don't know. He showed me the painting in a text, uh, but being high at the time, I forgot the name. <laughs> I've never been able to find it again, so if anybody recognizes this dancing couple, they're some little piece from way over in the side. This was also on a sewing machine table. Uh, I'm fascinated by the uh, story of Mark Landis, a strange man with an eidetic memory, at one point diagnosed as schizophrenic, greatly affected by the death of his father, and who was the art forger philanthropist who fooled so many of America's art world's curators. He sometimes donated copies of the same work to as many as six different museums, never profiting by any of his gifts, finally being unmasked by a curator out of OKC. A person can get caught up in trying to avoid a mistake in choice of material, in design, in conversation, almost anything, but then you can also get too forgiving and not push yourself, and not be willing to destroy bad work and undo mistakes. A person can make the stupidest choices because they won't ask anybody questions, but learning the right way to do things can sometimes shut off fruitful detours and fertile mistakes. Bad habits can certainly cost you in mosaics, but so can good habits. The field of mosaics sometimes seems to me to be staggering under the weight of overbroad assumptions or subtle expectations of what good art means. Part of this has to do with a long, honorable history of mosaic as decor. This is sometimes lent to the craft in both staunch traditionalist contemporary ideologues, a sort of, sort of unconscious bias to that which is tasteful, to that which is beautiful. There's some kind of no man's or no woman's land between fine mosaic art and folk art. One can, either do, one can do either, but usually not at the same time, usually not in the same person. Don't we find it harder to accept the idea of an investment banker as a folk artist than, say, a janitor or a sharecropper? Why is that? There's a branch of linguistics called pragmatics, which studies the way context contributes to meaning. Linguistics distinguishes between a sentence, which is an abstract entity divorced from non-linguistic context, and an utterance, which is a speech act in context. We can all think of utterances which are inappropriate for the situation in which they are used. And I'm not just thinking about coarse language in polite society, Kelly. <laughs> a, a visual work of art could be seen as an utterance. I've been trying to come up with what the sentence of art is and the context. I think most artists believe that context should be the accompanying artist statement, and that makes sense at first glance. 
An artist statement is only necessary in a time and culture where all context isn't already shared, isn't already assumed. In a, say, a, maybe a Byzantine church mosaic, the world of belief had by and large not been shattered. The pagans and Epicureans had pretty much all been either killed or driven into hiding. The internet hadn't so fragmented our shared cultural heritage. Now it seems like just about the only game in town for visual art in the last hundred years has been to test limits, play with artistic pragmatics in a way, be original. But the unquestioning view that innovation is by its very nature a good thing seems to me just as stultifying a preconception as the idea that one must always do things the same accepted way. Innovation in a field is just and only that. It may lead to either good or bad art. It is, can become a fetish, and it has become a fetish. One of the things we can say about mosaics, and I am sure there are probably exceptions, is that making them has a beginning, a middle, and an end. Unlike gardening, where everything is constantly changing and you never permanently do anything, the weeds always creep back, in a mosaic project, when you finish something, there it is, unchanging and fairly permanent. In our lives, there is always change, but death is an end to this life. Are we a garden or a mosaic? This was my first serious mosaic, and when I say serious, I meant it was the first time I ever made a mosaic that I was not pleasing some imaginary prospective buyer somewhere. I stripped away any audience for it in my head, just as my sister's death had stripped away the main audience that I was playing my own life to. Making it freed me up to embark on the rest of my journey in Mosaic. It's on a funky little piano bench, and it's a strange thing for anybody to have in their house. Uh, my brother's wife owns it now. Here's one way to think about death. It's... Uh, well, it's written over. It's from a Norse Edda. Uh, House Carls were your main servant. I didn't become a mosaicist because my sister died, nor because I saw what my father scrawled with his finger in the grime of the wellhouse window down in Texas, the place he and I built, hope and perseverance. My father died from Alzheimer's. He was one of many war heroes in World War II. He actually... Uh, his squadron dropped, uh, I don't know if you ever saw the HBO special Band of Brothers, his squadron dropped them. Uh, he lost five planes in his squadron. He had to ditch his plane on the way back into the uh, channel. Uh, here he is just goofing with his father in a small mill town up in Massachusetts. Isn't it strange how if one feels as I do that it's important to approach Mosaic as a kind of performance, like dancing or playing a musical instrument was before there was ways to record or photograph the performance, where the product of your skill and training and ex execution evaporated as soon as you'd done it, isn't it strange that I strive to stay in the now by using materials from the distant past and making things that are designed to persist far in the future? Why spend so much time memorializing if the object is to live in the present? Lethe was the name of the river in Hades that once you crossed it, you lost your memory. In southern New England, when the pilgrims and the Puritans first started arriving, waves of diseases had already spread among the native inhabitants, killing off as many as 90% of them along the Atlantic shorelines, spread by early contact with European fishing vessels. All along the footpaths that were still evident, there were foot-deep, circular memory holes marking a spot where any remarkable act had occurred. It was each person's responsibility to keep the holes maintained and to know and pass on the story of what had happened at that site so that, quote, many things of great antiquity are fresh in memory. I find that so incredib incredibly poignant, and it's almost like a photographic negative of a mosaic memorial, a hole where we would place, a hole where we would place a mosaic something that needs constant att attention, where a mosaic is meant to last with little care. This piece also reminds one of uh, bowling ball and pins. And there's that use of the word spare in the title. Uh, Dad wasn't a big bowling enthusiast. Uh, note the, uh, uh, the hint of a face here. 
and the one little blue dot that I drilled into the travertine over there, the background on this piece, these was devilishly hard trying to line them up between the, and to make it look to me like waves. How much of narrative art is just the self-pleasuring pattern recognition circuitry of the brain? For a while, I wanted this to be my epitaph, but it didn't really fit me. Uh, I don't get surly when I drink, and I don't drink that much, but what a bizarre thing to say about somebody. <laughs> when he got drunk, he doesn't kill his friends. <laughs> Years ago, on another Mosaic website and discussion board, not CMA, I met Patricia Helsing. She was a lively, engaging, and funny forum participant Besides being a talented artist, this is her at the age 10 or 11, I think, with her parakeet chirpy. Patricia and I argued about almost everything on two different mosaic boards. One of the main topics we discussed, along with a lot of other people, was the quality of the 2007 Sama exhibition in Mesa, the year that I won Best of Show. The truth is, when Deborah and I first viewed the show, I liked several pieces a lot, disliked several others a lot, and had mixed feelings about most of the others. One piece especially provoked a lot of controversy. It had, as I remember, a baby doll in it, and the only element that looked anything like what I would even call a mosaic was that it had some eggshell that had been crushed on it. I had, of course, it had, of course, fractured in kind of a mosaic-like fashion, and hence, it was called a mosaic. Others had varying attitudes about the show, including one person, a good writer, Joe Braun, who submitted a well-written review to the Sama Quarterly that was on the whole pretty negative, although she did compliment my work. But the piece was not printed and much discussion resulted. Patricia decided she liked the baby doll piece. She had not attended the conference, and in fact could not attend for reasons I later found out and I'm not even sure she'd even seen an image of the work before she began defending it. She infuriated and tickled me at the same time. She was fun to argue with. We emailed each other off the boards quite a bit with witticisms, musings, musings gossip. But it wasn't until a couple of months before she died that she told me, almost as she was embarrassed and apologetic for the pain the news might bring me, that she was dying of breast cancer after having fought it for something like 15 years. She thought it might upset me because she knew my sister had died of breast cancer. At some point, after, at some point soon after she told me of her illness, she e emailed me this really bad photo of herself and a man who would eventually become her husband in a cabin somewhere in the Rockies in the early 70s, a cabin they had broken into in the middle of a blizzard. I found the pose of complete delicious abandon on the bed to be just priceless. The person taking the photo was her husband at the time. <laughs> he died only a couple years after this photo was taken of cancer. And here's what I made of that photo. The big shard of glass on this piece has actually been inset into the work so that all the pieces you see behind it are actually much thinner than the surrounding material and have been cut separately from them. And that's gold foil it's kind of smeared on the big shard of glass. Believe it or not, oh, it's, spacing is wrong. Believe it or not, this was meant to be an exhortation to people, uh, a positive thing that uh, Paul Pott said to, to try to get people to believe that their only worth was to the community. Uh, Paul Pott didn't do much good in his life. This is also a very early work on a piano bench with very cheap tile. This is some very amateurish, and I see it now, uh, cuts. I didn't know how to I don't like those now. They shouldn't be there. There's no reason for them to be there in the narrative of the work, but I couldn't figure out how to do without them. Personal memorials are all about a backstory, the artist's statement, as it were. 
One experience of the artwork can be enriched and nourished by any information about the deceased the artist conveys. I made this piece shortly after hearing about my brother's cancer, having left the, la left the last fire line, as it were, and knowing that his end was fast approaching. That's a tiny, tiny piece of gold smalty in the tip of the arrow there. My brother was not an archer, nor was he a hunter. He was a good guy and a great father and a great grandfather, and he met his end with dignity and grace. And I'm uncomfortable with the feeling that I may be perceived as beating my breast in public over the things in life that everybody faces. I do not think I'm especially cursed. Sometimes I make art that is in some sense about stuff that has happened to me, and so does everybody, even the most abstract, white-on-white, -white, conceptual, textual mosaicist there is. And even though I've memorialized people who I've known and loved and who are now dead, and even though those felt like sacred tasks to me, I also know I'm painfully aware that I was throwing a lot of first world wealth at an expression of my own sorrow when billions of others have died and will die without any sort of memorial at all. Would that make things better if everyone had a memorial? Down in the oldest cemetery in San Antonio where some of my family are buried, people have made grave markers made of those round garden papers that you get at a Home Depot with Sharpie written on them and a plastic coated photo glued to them. There are also nearby marble spires and a mausoleum. In just a little while, it will be a long time ago. This title is of course from the first line of that old spiritual, I'll fly away. Alexander the Great Calvary commander, his best friend and his lover was Hephaestion. And when he died, Alexander had a great temple constructed in his honor and had him declared one of the gods to the great disgruntlement of many of his soldiers. Of course, the most prominent example of memorials in my work is the columbarium work I did for St. Paul's Episcopal Cathedral in OKC. This project took me the most time, the most planning, and what was an entirely new experience for me at the time extensive collaboration with others, especially one person. The retiring dean of St. Paul's, a much beloved man who saw this as his last legacy to his church, was the traditional 800-pound gorilla in the room. In the end, his was the sole opinion that mattered. But he was and is one of the kindest, most unassuming 800-pound gorillas there are, and so, although he had very deep feelings as to what the columbarium of art needed to accomplish, he was completely unable or unwilling to vo voice anything that even remotely seemed like a direction or a plan. Our meetings went on for months. I grew very fond of and infuriated with the sweet old guy. He was especially concerned that the works of art were not lonely in feel. that's up in the tree. Uh, in between the bubble glass tile are gold smalty and tiny shards of blown gra glass from the shops up in Seattle area, uh, which was given to me by Joe Braun. None of the uh, niches were uh, yet occupied when this photo was taken. I've had people come up to me when they realize who I am and tell me which column their ashes are to be deposited in or which their loved ones are already in. And they tell me with tears in their eye how much their art means to me. And I know this sounds cliche, but uh, it's a profoundly humbling experience. I, can, I can't think of anything to say when they say that to me. This is one of my very favorite pieces I've ever made. It's hard to meaningfully talk about Andamento in my style of mosaic, but I do love the flow in this piece. Uh, this is on one of the columns. Uh, I love this haunch piece. It's all one piece. And I like the face cuts. In each of the column, there's six column pieces and the big tree. Wait, I went too far. 
in, uh, a little piece of the uh, tree is represented. You can just see it in the background there. Uh, there's a little leaf. So it, this is a uh, view of St. Paul's. Those, that sky there was done within about 10 seconds. And I think it provided the structure for the whole piece. Uh, this little, you can't see it. There's a little guy in a uh, wheelchair here, which is based on a very dear friend of ours, uh, Tom, who uh, died about four years ago or so. In this piece, I had originally drawn a dog in the water going the same direction, but George, the retiring dean, looked at the drawing like it was some kind of side dish he'd never ordered. So I replaced the dog with the child. And, uh, well, to Deborah and I, child, dog, same difference. <laughs> Again, the uh, lines provide the structure, the lines in the water. I forgot what this one's called. I miss a lot of my pieces. This work is not a memorial to anyone, but it's about memorials. The plate she's holding in her lap with the guy's head on it was from a commemorative plate from North Carolina, I believe. I don't remember the guy's name who was being commemorated, nor why he was being commemorated. So tough, buddy, I don't know what to tell you. Uh, there's a little fish in the water. You can barely see it up here. It doesn't show up very well. The uh, obol was the coin placed in the mouths of the dead as payment to Sharon, I believe it's pronounced, who would ferry them across to Hades. But now I think we should have a change of place. Uh, face, let's uh, cleanse the palate. Uh, let's all this talk of death. And uh, here's a great photobomb photo. So the next will be just some series I did. Uh, these are from the house that I rebuilt, a block from our house I got, got for back taxes and worked on it uh, right after my sister died for about a year and a half. Uh, and I pulled three doors out of it because uh, I couldn't use them anymore. This piece is actually uh, still, in a, uh, still in a shed. It never sold. Uh, it had been a flop house. It was a total gutting and restructuring job. Uh, most investors would have dozed a lot, and that's what my friends recommended. But I'd been, I'd been trying to quit programming for a lot of years, and uh, I went back to college for a couple semesters thinking I was getting a botany degree. Uh, and that's where I met Deborah, and that's when the house became mine. And there's a bad perspective problem here. I had this laying down. I couldn't back away from it. I didn't have a selfie stick. They weren't around at that point. The, I didn't want the sidewalk to curl off like that. I wanted it. I thought I was making it just straight down the deal, but working on it at waist height, I didn't notice it until I stood it up. It really pissed me off. But there it was. This is a second door. That's. Uh, after the party, she dreams of Arturo. And there's the third door. It was also called Chickens of the Apocalypse. There's chickens down there. All right. The second series is called Boat Ride. There's only two pieces. It's hard to call that a series, uh, but. She's just, she's just standing there thinking about what, where her life went wrong, thinking about that boat ride, about Larry. And here's Larry. <laughs> I 
This, uh, in my universe, whatever stance one takes to approaching a problem in the workshop, whatever strategy one employs to get yourself to drag your sorry butt in there, whatever philosophical conundrum you solve to give yourself the space to create amidst the clamor of your own life and the maelstrom of the world, that conundrum only stays solved for a moment or two. You may be back attempting to solve the problem again in the next minute. That uh, wall cut, this was done with the, uh, that's why it's called with Arena, with the little saw that Arena gave me. Um, and that was very thin, thin wall tile that enabled me to do that. The, uh, let me see, wait a minute, am I going to the, yes, right there. The picture is about a, I don't know, 200 million year old uh, club moss fossil in the window. Those are turquoise handles for the uh, uh, stove. If you say learn the basics, that's a good idea until it inadvertently constricts you. If you try to ceaselessly innovate, it's a good mantra until it limits you because even the quest for innovation can be a rut. If you believe mosaics has an essential nature, then the drive to discover that nature may nourish your art until it doesn't. If you develop and polish a technique, it may take you to wonderful heights of accomplishment until it strands you there. And if you believe your primary, primary identity is as a mosaicist, it may be an exceptionally fruitful and fulfilling identity until the day that the most creative thing you can do may be to stop doing mosaics. Market day, two more. This was a very bad photo, I'm sorry about this. Uh, John in England, John, who was head of, head of, O'Brien. yeah, O'Brien has this piece. Here's the second one. This is what won uh, Best of Show down in Mesa. The onyx in the sky was incredibly fragile. Mm -hmm. Some of the most fragile stuff I've ever worked with. You could just be holding it and it would break, just a mess. The stuff had so many fractures in it. Uh, it's a Paleolithic uh, stone woman, kind of like the uh, Venus of Willendorf, which is about 28,000 years old. And here's just two uh, works. They're kind of self-explanatory. Sometimes the art is in the lines, sometimes primarily in the materials, sometimes in neither. What am I doing on time? I'm fine? Or am I? Sometimes the art is in the lines, sometimes in the materials, sometimes in neither. Is one of these the essence of mosaic? Do eyes following lines imply some kind of narration? Is narration in mosaic just irretrievably, pathetically retro and not cool, ironic retro, but romance novelist, faux folk retro? There's the second one. Just a few lines with a seam in the piece. Big winds. This is uh, not about the weather when I made it. That's not what I was thinking about. I watched a Kelly Rush documentary on PBS just a week before coming here about Emery Blagden, a man who spent much of his time building what he called a healing machine in a shed out of a bazillion pieces of wire, scrap metal, little jars of stuff, just anything he could lay his hands on. Blagden's parents and all his siblings but one had died of cancer fairly early on. He never bathed and he did not think of what he did as art. So making him a perfect candidate for what art experts would designate as a vernacular artist. Vernacular is a descriptor of language. It's interesting that it became a visual arts category. I think it describes strange or very poor people who believe their art has a purpose beyond itself. They do not maintain an ironic distance from it. Their art is not self-reflexive. To put it another way, if someone builds a PowerPoint presentation about what they do, most if not all of his vernacular artist street creds disappear. After Blagden died of cancer, when they auctioned off all his earthly goods, 
um, guy, a pharmacist that knew him, outbid Blagdon's one surviving sibling for the healing machine and took it all to New York City, where it was displayed in galleries for years until it was acquired by the Kohler Foundation. His work, his healing work, his lifelong struggle with his own personal conundrums was decontextualized to a higher dollar, higher status zip code, where people could see it on their lunch break, perhaps. People who are recognized art experts on art can then comment on it, alert others to its value, its place in the vernacular firmament. I just got a call from the woman who bought this piece, who is now in her mid-80s. She wanted me to speculate on its value. I think I've uh, developed an algorithm that, it devel that devel delivers the vernacularity index for, well, for uh, artists. Uh, I think that's self-explanatory. Does the VI show up over there or is it behind the bush? Anyway, I think that works. It's an hour spent. Time for There's uh, Emery right there. Isn't that a wonderful face? Jeez, I just love that picture. This one is also not about the weather, or maybe it's about internal weather. The next series, 23rd and Penn is the intersection close to our house. Uh, our neighborhood has been going through a lot of stresses. Um, Not sure what to say about that. It's uh, I made this work. It, this one won the Technical Innovation Award down in Houston two years ago. I made this work in between numerous trips down to Texas the last few months of my brother's life. And so to me, perhaps to me alone, it's in part a memorial to him, even though it doesn't really betray anything to do with him. His neighborhood never has characters like her. His life and concerns are not really shown here, except maybe somewhere in that office tower behind her. And you've already seen those glass circles in the uh, uh, columbarium work for the uh, St. Paul's in the sky. The work was finished off by a blowtorch. I, I shaved off uh, dirt, crayon, lots of different things in her hair, uh, uh, brown sugar, various things like that. Here's the second in this tiny little series. Uh, Drury Lane, the famous uh, nursery rhyme on that, was actually a uh, place of great vice and danger. Uh, I think mosaicists tend to be conservative because of the nature of their work. I do not necessarily mean politically conservative, but instead rather inclined to support the status quo if it is currently affording them the time and the means to create painstaking, durable work. First of all, exacting craft of any type takes a long time to do, and it needs a fairly non-chaotic environment, like stable tables and access to some fundamental tools and materials, and a certain amount of law and order in the streets. Damn few mosaics are made in refugee camps. And Public mosaic works require a fairly large investment, larger than mural painting. They are meant to last longer. Cultures, cultures represent themselves in mosaics and talk across generations when they do so. Marauding gangsters and shock troops and drone strikes and opposing religions all play hell with mosaics, in many cases intentionally so. So does grinding poverty. Mosaicists are different in this regard from, say, graffiti artists who can create pretty quickly and get out and who do not rely on stability to do what they want. Their paint is cheaper too than most mosaic materials. If I spend all these hours carefully making a piece, if I buy and maintain the saws, if I have a dedicated little room in my house for them, and I buy all these materials, but mostly if I spend all this time making one, then it is pretty much by definition a luxury item. Apparently, I cannot be pleased with stacking rocks and rivers like this a guy in Zion National Park just doing temporary work. No, sometimes I require gold smalty and travertine and brick and marble and beautiful glass tile to make a piece that says what exactly? 
advances what cause, explains what belief. Meanwhile, a sea of people in my neighborhood and on this planet are so much flotsam and jetsam. Deborah and I have toyed with the idea of changing our names to flotsam and jetsam. <laughs> Again, there's more circles from the uh, columbarium sky. The next uh, pieces uh, are from a series uh, that was at the British Associated Modern Mosaic uh, called, and I called it Lunch, and I'll just kind of flip through these fairly quickly. Uh, they were most part uh, using cheap materials and exploring simple eruptions out of the fairly uh, 2D work where most of my work adheres. Some were drawn from scratch, others were transformation of elements from some photograph. I attended them as a demonstration of what could be done with wet saws. This uh, cut around here, I'm especially proud of. That's all one piece, all around like that. That's all one piece around the bird. The bird set back in. Another one, another one, I don't know what that name means. There's one over there. A mosaicist named Ora Avni was a participant of one of the first online discussions I engaged in on whether mosaics is a materials defined discipline. The title is a pun on her name. Uh, this has got some good saw cuts in it. Uh, the bird lining that up. This had to be cut in there. Hard to explain how that happened. If you look at the uh, belly cut and the arm cut, what does that add to this photograph to know that I actually cut that into the material? It's not drawn on like with a Sharpie. What does that matter, especially if you're only seeing it in a photo? If it was drawn on the tile with a Sharpie and you didn't know it, or if you hadn't even considered that it wasn't drawn on, you just assumed that it was, would that make any difference to your appreciation of it? I think that it does unavoidably. Knowing that those are actually actual cuts instantly sets off a little calculator in our primate, primate brains. And I think that little calculus of time and skill is an essential part of mosaic. The reason it can't primarily be a conceptual art. The disparity between the amount of labor that goes into something small and strange like this and the object that is made, if that object is ugly or distasteful or reminiscent of unpleasant things or is just plain goofy, that disparity is where a little surprise comes in, a little gap in our expectations of what high labor craft should look like, of what contemporary non-vernacular mosaic should look like. And that gap, that crack is where art can get in sometimes. It's certainly not the only way, but it's a way. That's uh, unglazed porcelain dust from stuff I hit with a hammer. If you dedicate a bunch of hours on a piece that is not pretty or tasteful, is not serious, that dedication to whimsy or absurdity or some other kind of willful non-marketability, that non-paying dedication, devotion really, can sometimes rise to the same level that craftspeople have demonstrated for millennia when making stuff for God or God's spokespeople or his enforcers. We have to assume that Byzantine mosaicers were creating scenes that were imbued with heartfelt beliefs. For many of us in this day and age, finding those scenes to depict unquestionable truths, verities to be proclaimed, can be nearly impossible or worse, non-marketable. This is a weird one. Um, yeah, that's all I can say. That's a weird one. <laughs> this is again uh, Persephone again with her six seeds. There's a short little series. And this is what I was talking about in the panel, trying to abstract into just the fewest little lines. Drawing very fast and accepting those lines, not correcting even problematic ones, can be a form of devotion to a work, or rather to a moment when creating a work, deeming it the bedrock moment, as it were. He's got on little smalty shorts. <laughs> and 
as humans, we've been throwing things for probably around 2 million years. What a tremendous boost to brain development this must have been. Prediction of the speed and angle that a prey or predator is moving, intention. A whole lot of other animals have been completely flummoxed by this ability of ours to extend harm far beyond the reaches of our limbs. Many species have consequently gone extinct. These next two pieces weren't actually conceived as a series, but in retrospect, they seem to be. I believe that practically all meaning in life is applied backwards. One retrospects and then applies the plot line. This is, she was a background figure in a news photo. Okay, that's end of the series, a series. This is just ice in one of our dog bowls. I thought that was <laughs> nice. I don't know why it formed like that. I was originally going to call this piece Clement's Lake after Clement Greenberg, the uh, New York art critic that so influenced what the second half of the 20th century saw as contemporary. He brought English speakers the word kitsch. He championed abstract expressionism, I think, uh, and exemplifies the supremacy of Manhattan in the art world of that time. This is a three foot by five foot, and it hangs in our bedroom. I, want, I wanted to do a slightly slanted take on a Norman Rockwell sort of work. Those grass and plants back there that runs all along the shore, that alone took about two weeks. There's some of it up close. Tiny, tiny little pieces. And there's some more. The little bird, a picnic table, a thermos. And there's just a few more slides. This tiny little piece belongs to a very dear friend of ours who's become a compulsive rescuer of dogs and cats. She was married to the guy in the wheelchair in the columbarium piece a while back. He uh, died by his own hand a couple years ago. Uh, she moved from the renovated church that they lived in and they held music events in and she moved with all her dogs and cats to a tiny little house. This was an extremely difficult piece to cut and to place. I put in some uh, Indian meal moths. Uh-oh. Up there, even though they weren't in the original photo. Uh, and I added the pencil to help with those cuts down there because every time I tried to cut them, they were just too slender and they kept breaking. This is all travertine. It's uh, lining up those twig cuts just drove me crazy. Trying to get them, it was not happy times. Staying abreast of each moment as it laps against me is the only way not to screw up the cut. The cut requires it. Cutting stone, placing tessera can be a form of mindfulness, but it's not the tranquil, aware of the breeze in your hair kind of tranquility that seems to be the stereotype when or if one thinks of mindfulness. It's hard to link the ecstasy of being totally consumed by dancing or playing music that some people can feel like they are inextricably joined to the moment with the constraint of cutting and meticulously placing little bits of stone and glass. But they dwell, do dwell in the same neighborhood, or they can, which is not saying I get there very often. This one was down in Austin at the MAI. That's a little walking stick insect in there in the foreground. This is a six-foot fortune, six foot fortune-telling grubworm. I'm not going to say much more about that other than the original idea was for a six-foot fortune-telling grubworm costume in a lair place in our, of business down in our basement, an idea that uh, for some reason never came to fruition. Now, this sold in about the first 15 minutes that it was displayed in the gallery. That's a travertine tongue, uh, granite background. Uh, I can't remember if that's, I think that's porcelain snake. I don't, it looks like travertine. I think that was porcelain. This has got little, uh, the, that wood tiled, uh, uh, 
floor tile that's got printed wood uh, pattern on it. Uh, I can't put my finger on it, but there seems to be something aesthetically suspect, aesthetically suspect, mixing cheap printed tile with natural stone or high dollar glass. I mean, if it's all smalty or stone tessera, that's one thing, or if it's all battle, bottle caps you picked up in the neighborhood or a giant flip-flop monkey, but if it's, they're mixed, it's somehow suspect. It's just a little uh, frog. My barber, uh, Bert, took me noodling a couple times. Y'all know what noodling is? Yeah. Noodling is where you go into a uh, river and you stick your hands in dark holes under water and hope that a big fish bites them, a big catfish, and then you pull the catfish out. These catfish can be 40, 50 pounds, and there's a big struggle. Uh, I think this whole piece was just an excuse to work with that water stuff because that was such great tile to work with. I'm almost out of it now. It cut like butter. It was just so much fun. This is uh, called the, either the gift of La, Min La Malinche or the gift from La Malinche. La Malinche was the Mayan woman that Cortez was given on his way to conquering the Aztecs. She became his mistress and his principal translator. Mistress is probably not the right term. Of course, one of the gifts that the conquistadors brought was Christianity, hence another piece of the Ten Commandments place uh, piece that, uh, in, in what she's holding. Just think of all that incredible Aztec and Incan art melted down to make bullion and coins, illustrating as well as anything the commodification of all our ideas of value. Gold and silver being prized for thousands of years for the use in art, but increasingly becoming just units. The Spaniards found great riches in a mountain in Bolivia called Cerro Rico, and most of the silver they mined went to China to pay for porcelain, which then flooded Europe, while at the same time spreading the commodification of wealth through the silver, the value of all things in terms of coin, into China. And by the way, when they shipped that silver up to Acapulco and transported it across to Mexico City, it was guarded by hard to believe, uh, Japanese samurai, strange little uh, factoid. There's just a tiny bit of porcelain in this work, but it's not the kind that Europe went nuts for back then. Now increasingly gold and silver are mined at great cost to humans and its environment, and then kept in forms of bars and coins and vaults. Many of them again underground, so that it has, all come, it has come about that we lift this stuff out of the earth, refine it, and mint it, and then bury it again after we assigned it an owner. Hundreds of thousands, maybe even millions of men, have died in the mines of Cerro Rico, that mountain in Bolivia. The idea that there is an abstract value to gold and silver apart from its decorative value is so accepted by us and so intertwined with civilization that it is hard to step outside of. It's another piece by uh, photograph based on a photograph by Elliot Erwitt. It's a very early piece. Domingo is, of course, Spanish for Sunday. And speaking of Sunday, this is a 10-foot commemorative wall medallion for uh, these people's 100th anniversary. They contacted me within a week of St. Paul's contacting me years ago. It took me about seven months working in the front room of our house because our workshop was too way too small to fit the table or actually groups of table in. You can tell it's summer because the windows are open. That's little bits of gold smalty embedded in the uh, uh, middle part there. I was dumbfounded when they first approached me. It was the first time I'd ever worked with smalty except for one small piece I'd done for an arts organization which was that goofy thing. And I knew no one at the church. I tried to direct them to some other mosaicists that had a lot more experience with Smalty, but they wanted me to try it. There is, uh, and there's uh, Bob, the assistant 
pastor. He's a really nice guy. And this was just one of the most pleasant experiences working with these folks. Uh, although the final assembly on the wall was a nerve wracking experience. The wall they built was not perfectly level, although I warned them it needed to be. And then one of the shades of blue I'd saved to finish the seams in the line turned out to be not quite the right shade of blue. So I had to cannibalize the ocean to, fit, <laughs> to finish the line. And that's not a sentence you're likely to hear again. And there's the celebration of it up there. This was done, not done for a church or didn't commemorate anybody. It's one of my favorite titles. Titling is one of my favorite things. We are all driven to making mosaics for different reasons. I want to try to make what I see or I want to make what I feel or I want to show what other, others what the essence of mosaic is. I want to build the community. I want to show people uh, what making uh, mosaic using only the color red or recycled materials, stuff that I found. Some of my mosaics have been actually made just to flesh out a title that I had. I never thought about being a visual artist until I was in my mid-40s. Before that, it was all about words. This is a meditation on middle age. It almost destroyed my hands, all the, the forest in the background. It was the first time I realized that the constant vibration of the saws was doing to them. The couple is from a 1525 sketch done of dancing peasants by a guy named uh, Urs Graf, a Swiss uh, artist. The background is all mine, and the couple have been heavily modified. This one best 2D at a 2008 mosaic exhibition at Mary Washington University, organized by Jean Ann Dopp. As various parts of the body begin to wear out, if one is lucky enough to live long enough to be able to say that, one might find oneself asking, is there enough value in what I'm doing to justify the wear and tear? This is referring to the second law of thermodynamics. The sweater here is quartzite slate. And I spent a lot of time getting the fabric folds and body contours the way I wanted them. And then I went in and recut parts of it to represent steam coming off the cup of coffee, which you can't see very well in this photo. The Ten Commandments plate I used uh, in the portrait of my mother and the La Malinche is also contributed to this work. I lifted out bear witness from thou shalt not bear fault witness or being tweeted by the little bird here. I like the admonition to bear witness. If I could have spelled out the words, don't take it personally, that would have been even better. As viewers of art, we of course usually cannot see things that the artist means to hide, and I mean really hide, not hide and then reveal in an artist statement or an interview or a Facebook post. The hidden joke, the obscure reference to something in his or her own life, the use of material that has special unrevealed significance just for the artist. If the artist presents a deflected gaze and does not stare ironically into the viewer's eyes, then the joke, the information, the little subset of meaning may die with the artist. So be it, there are worse things. I've also called this piece the burning of the library at Alexandria. The, through the ubiquity of technology, of screens everywhere, we have become incessant searchers after hyperpalatable experiences. Continuous entertainment, dancing colored lights, produced by moving our thumbs. It's a frightening phenomenon to me. People have become afraid of any experience that's not instantly shown to someone that's not there. Besides jokes, besides self-reflexive neural tweets, there are other kinds of hidden art too. There's the art of compromise between vision and means, which is not a highly valued art. There's the art of acceptance of fault in a work and how, you can, how that can nourish the rest of one's life the life not connected to a gallery or studio. And there's the art of sweeping one's own floor or of arranging one's materials, and I suck at that art. This is the only mosaic I've made in the last year, an address sign for our house. It was actually kind of hard and it took me quite some time. I recently finished working on extensive reconstruction of our front room of our house, especially the fireplace. The decorative brickwork was originally really well done back in 1927, but the foundation to support the brickwork was not well done, and the whole structure had, over the decades, slowly tilted forward and down. 
This is the very beginning of the project. The, uh, you can see, you can't see the lean very well and I've already removed some of the floor. There's where a whole fabric of lies I was telling myself about this project at this point. I was telling myself I'd be able to tilt the whole fireplace back in place. Maybe, please God, please, please, please. But no, I had to uh, disassemble the fireplace brick by brick, numbering the bricks as I went, and then I relayed the fireplace in the exact same design so that it would fit back under the oak mantel that I had managed to save intact. The brickwork part of this project is a whole lot like that work of fiction by Borges about the rewritten, yet exactly the same masterpiece. I do think my fireplace, even with a couple of glaring amateurish mistakes, is more creative than the original. The assumption was that after all this mountain of work, I would naturally use the opportunity to use the space above the fireplace mantle as a canvas for the skills I have developed so assiduously over the past 16 years, but I didn't do that. This was a work originally meant for gallery work, but I have found to my surprise that it fit almost perfectly into the indented area in the original fireplace brick. The main element of this work is actually a miscut series of pieces that are originally intended for the St. Paul's Columbarium. That marble in the middle, I cut it all out on a template that I turned over by mistake. And I didn't notice it until I was done. At that point, Deborah left the house for a couple hours. Um, okay, yeah, I'm just two, two slides away. Um, the, furthermore, when I was working on this piece, I uh, broke several of the uh, pieces when I was trying to correct something else and then trying to correct those, I broke several more. I got so angry, I put it away for two or three years. When I came, finally came back to it, I named it Like Lens because Lynn Adamo had created a work shortly before this. I did this one that she simply labeled Untitled. I figured that's what I was gonna call this one, but since she had already taken that title, <laughs> I called it the next best thing. And here it is embedded in the fireplace you can't see it very well. Uh, there, it's horizontal, although I... And that's where I'm gonna leave it. And there's our front room of our house. There's the remote. There's the ratty couch, the uh, TV. Increasingly, as our technologies have quick, quickened our conversations about politics, about art, about religion, about the planet, all the ideas seem to go stale after just a few months, weeks, days, even hours. The art world no longer has any front line. There's no geographical nexus, no epicenter, regardless of what the outlandish prices and galleries most frequented by the world's power brokers in certain cities may tell us. And there's no nexus in the mosaic world either, regardless of the history of this region or that. There's only the making, for whatever reason, the making and the creating, and then the cleanup. Thank you. <laughs>